Bienvenue, mesdames et messieurs. À cette présentation, c'est à cause de mon design. Je m'appelle Larry Garfield. Malheureusement, euh, mon français n'est pas le mieux. Alors, le reste de ce talk will be in English. Yeah. <coughs> oh. <laughs> That's it. My name is Larry Garfield. Uh, you may know me online as Krell, C R E L L. Uh, if you want to make fun of me on Twitter during the talk, that's where you do so. I'm a senior architect with Palantir.net. We're a web development shop based in Chicago in the United States. I am one of the lead developers for Drupal 8. Um, I'm the Drupal representative to the Framework and Interoperability Group, advisor to the Drupal Association, and uh, general purpose busybody that people fly around to uh, complain about code. So that's what I'm going to do for now. <coughs> so this talk is about aphorisms of APIs. What does that mean? Let's start off by defining some of our terms here. What is an API? An API is an application programming interface. That means we are talking about code that is designed to talk to other code. The interface here is things that programmers use and other code uses, not end users. This is code intended for other code. An aphorism is a concise statement containing a subjective truth or observation cleverly and pithily written. Note, subjective truth or observation. These are not rules, they are more like guidelines. So really what we're going to be talking about here are clever and pithy sayings about good code. Most of what I say here is not uh, Drupal specific. I'm going to use some Drupal examples, but nothing I say here is Drupal specific. Most of it, frankly, is not PHP specific, although again, that's the examples we're going to use. <coughs> and a reminder, these are guidelines, these are uh, approximations, these are aphorisms, so you will find an exception to everything I'm about to say. I can find an exception to everything I'm about to say. So our first aphorism, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Number one, who here is familiar with Isaac Asimov, the writer? All right. In one of his books, The Gods Themselves, uh, he postulated that two is the least likely number in the universe. For those who haven't read the book, um, humans are contacted by aliens from another dimension, plot happens, and one of the characters towards the end realizes, why would there only be two to parallel dimensions in the universe? If there's two, why not more? Why not an infinite number? Why would there only be two possibilities? That's ridiculous. And that applies in science, and that also applies in architecture and software design. Things can be unique, and you can have a lot of them, but you're never going to have just two. There are multiple possible implementations of an interface or a service or a program or whatever, then there are potentially an infinite number and your program needs to account for that. What does that mean in practice? It means don't use numeric constants for things. Use machine names, use strings. Why? So let's uh, have a look at this code example. Oops, wrong button. So we've got uh, some load function <coughs> that loads um, there's some kind of articles out of your system, great. So you pass in a status code, which means it's either published or it's in a draft state. And you know, we look up records that have that, uh, that state value, and we load them in a one big go, great, wonderful, and this is going to work great, until someone tries to extend your system, and they both define the same constant for three. What happens at this point? I have no idea, but it's not going to be good. It's completely undefined what happens here other than bugs. Instead, this makes that status code a string. Status published, status draft, which means if someone else comes along and makes status unpublished or status needs approval, that's not going to break. Because you have not hard-coded yourself into having only a fixed number of possibilities, you have an infinite number of possibilities, as long as the strings don't collide. That's a lot easier to avoid than numbers. But wait, I'm sure someone is going to say, what about Booleans? Are Booleans not two-state, true and false? Well, no. Booleans are not a two-state value. Booleans do not mean A or B, either or. Booleans mean <coughs> true or absence of true. It's a very important distinction. You do not have you know, a Boolean to decide, do I use mechanism A or mechanism B? Which mode am I in? No. Booleans are solely for yes and not yes. They are true and not true. That's it. 
Uh, I see an example here. <clears throat> access is a Boolean. Does the user X have permission to perform an operation on object Y? Maybe, yes, no, that's a Boolean. Because they either have access or they have not access. How do we determine whether or not they have access? There's an infinite number of possible ways to determine, does this user have permission to do this action? Do not hard code yourself into just one, or just five, or just three that you can think of. I guarantee you, someone will think of more tomorrow. Uh, corollary to this is what I like to egotistically call Garfield's Law. One is a special case of many. What does that mean? So let's take an example from Drupal. Uh, node load multiple. Node is the kind of standard entity object in Drupal for data objects. Back in the bad old days in Drupal 6, we had a routine that looked somewhat like this. This is oversimplified, um, where you pass in a node ID, and we look up that record from our main table here. <clears throat> All right, we get that object back, and then we let other parts of the system load extra stuff onto that object. Usually that extra stuff involved look, looking things up from other tables. Um, that way, you can have an object that's built up by contributed modules uh, when it gets loaded. Great, flexible, wonderful. Great up until you want to load multiple of these at the same time. And then, this didn't exist in Drupal 6, but if you wanted to load lots of nodes together, this is what you would have to do. Load all of those initial objects, great. And then for each of them, call this load extra stuff function. Problem. We said before, load extra stuff probably hits the database. So if we load 10 nodes, we're going to call load extra stuff 10 times and hit the database 10 times. And you'll see the problem with this. This is known as the select n plus 1 problem uh, because you're going to select for you know, loading 10 nodes, 10 objects, you're going to hit the database 10 times plus 1 to get that initial list. This is also known as a great way to make your database administrator hate you. Please do not make your database administrator hate you. They, you don't want to be on the bad side, trust me. Instead, this is what we did in Drupal 7. Again, somewhat oversimplified. Loading multiple objects at the same time is the default. That's how everything works. And then, when you get that uh, list back, all that extra stuff takes the entire array. So it can hit the database once for all 10 nodes, get back the record, uh, the add on information for all 10 of those nodes, and do what it needs to do. And then, you just want to load one node? Great. Loading one node is loading an array of one value. One is a special case of many. Because the logic then is exactly the same everywhere else. Your performance is exactly the same. Loading one node or 50 nodes is going to hit the database the exact same number of times. And that's good. That lets you scale. So rule number one, n is the only number. Number two, it's a quote from Rasmus Leodorf, founder of PHP, fail fast, fail cheap, be lazy, because laziness is good. What this really means is make the code debug for you. Really, the whole purpose, yeah, who likes debugging? Who enjoys finding errors? You feed people just sick. <laughs> there are great things down here. Most people don't enjoy debugging. It's really boring and tedious. Computers are, are inventions created for the purpose of doing boring and tedious work for us so that we don't have to. Let the code do the work for you. Don't plan for everything that could happen. I think there's an infinite number of things that could go wrong. Instead, plan for what you will do when, not if, they go wrong. <clears throat> example here. This is, uh, again, oversimplified example from the Drupal 6 uh, theming system. We had a theme function, you pass in you know, an ID of you know, something you want to uh, render to HTML and give it some variables. And the system looks up in an index of, okay, what possible themable things do we have? And if it doesn't find the one you're asking for, it just returns null. And this value then gets concatenated with other strings to build up a page. What happens in PHP when you concatenate null with a string? Null gets cast to an empty string, and it's exactly the same as if you returned an empty string. So what happens if you have a bug in, like, you make a typo in the name of that key? Good luck finding it. Really. I do not want to think about how much time of my life I have lost 
tracking down typos because this line hid the fact from me that I had a typo. Your code should not hide bugs from you. Your code should find bugs for you rather than hiding them. That's the whole point. So in Drupal 7, we changed it. So if it can't find that key, it, like the other logic changed a little bit, it logs it. it this is the uh, Drupal 7 logging mechanism there. Great. So now, if I try to, you know, if I'm writing code, I try to render something, and I'm getting back nothing, I can say, huh, oh, I'll go check the log. Check in the log, and it says, hmm, that thing you tried to look up doesn't exist. I look at it and go, oh, because I throw TEH instead of T-H-E, like, like I always do. And I can now go and fix my bug in about 15 seconds, rather than an hour and a half pulling my hair out because I don't know what's wrong with my code. Not that that's ever happened to me. <coughs> who's, ever, who, who's old enough to remember this era? Same people, huh? <laughs> Is this why you enjoy debugging? <laughs> Yeah, you never met General Failure? Yeah, he's a nice guy. He's also a major pain. Only, only they get it. Okay. Who's gotten this error, though? Or something like it? Own up to it. Own up to it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you get this with not just Drupal. Drupal gets it a lot, but you get this error a lot. I just files with the pink Who's gotten something like this error? Okay. What does <laughs> go away? What does this tell you about what your bug is? Absolutely nothing. Where is your error? Well, this means somewhere you uh, have an array you're iterating over. That's not, not an array, but a string. Where did that string come from? I don't know. Where did that? You know, you know, where were you defining the data structure that had whatever that array is in it? That's not an array. I don't know. <laughs> This is part of Drupal's form system. Drupal's form system was all built on arrays, nested arrays. So you have an error somewhere in some large data structure of arrays, and God only knows where it is. I have no idea. Good luck finding it. Please do not do this to yourself. We're fixing this in Drupal 8, largely. <clears throat> Code failure is like voting in Chicago, for those who get the, the joke. Fail early, fail often. Let the code find the bugs for you. How do you do that? You constrain the inputs and fail usefully. Don't fail with useless messages. Fail with worthwhile messages. Good APIs are picky. Example here. This is the uh, query builders in Drupal 7. We have uh, our field and values uh, parameters here type hinted. What happens if you pass in a string or something that's not an array to this method? You get a fatal error telling you, hey, on line this of this file, you call this method with something that's not an array, go fix it. And you know exactly where your bug was because it gives you a file and line number to go fix it. If you didn't do that and you passed in a string, then somewhere, you know, an hour later in your code, you'll actually get an error when you try to do something with that array. Where did that error come from? I don't know. This tells you exactly where that error comes from. Sometimes type hinting isn't enough. So, um, we do, we do a check. In SQL, on insert statements, you can tell a field, you know, set this, this field to this value, or set this field to whatever the default value in the schema is. If you use, try to specify the same field in both of those lists, however, you will get a completely useless parse error out of SQL, because MySQL doesn't give useful error messages. It just says, hey, parse error here, and I'll show you half the query. This is not very helpful, guys. Thanks. So instead, we check for you. Did you specify the same field in both of those lists? If so, we know it's never going to work. So we throw an error, uh, throw an exception with an error message that describes exactly what you did wrong, including the fields you put in both cases. You as a developer can then go, I'm getting a, a fatal error. I'm getting an exception. Why? Read it. Oh, that's why. I'm going to fix your bug. Your code should find the bugs for you. A good programmer is someone who always looks both ways before crossing a one-way street. Just because no one has a reason to be coming down the street from the left doesn't mean they won't. Just because there is no good reason for a user to ever input this value guarantees that they will do so at some point. Be prepared for that. Which also means, if you are not developing uh, your, uh, under eAll and eStrict, you are doing it wrong. Who's doing it wrong? Please start turning on eAll and eStrict. 
This tells PHP, be pedantic and picky and find my bugs before they cause a problem. Why in the world would you not let the computer find bugs for you before they hit production? Please, find your bugs before they hit production. That's what a good uh, uh, system is for. Fail fast, fail cheap, fail usefully. Number three, you can't teach what you don't know. And you don't know what you can't teach. Corollary to that, if you can't document it, you don't understand what you're doing. For that matter, if you don't document it, I can't understand what you're doing. If I can't understand what you're doing, why am I going to use your code? It took a while to find some examples here, but uh, this is an example out of Drupal 7. We've got a doc block on this <laughs> method, great, and it tells us the return type, okay, file transfer FTP, and we, the description, good. We know that it's a subclass of that and so forth, and we pass it jail and settings. What are those? What's the legal value for jail? Is that a sheet root path? Is it relative to the root file system? Is it relative to Drupal's root? What is that? I have absolutely no idea. No one in this room can tell me what this means, and I don't know either, and I'm a Drupal developer. Or settings, oh good. I'm assuming, since this is an array, that this is some kind of configuration options. What are the, the possible parameters for it? Um. Anyone else know? Yeah, that's what I thought. I have no clue. Don't do this to yourself, don't do this to everyone else. Here's a worse example out of uh, Drupal's date module. Again, this is older code. Date, entity, metadata, field, getter. Object, options, name, object type, context. Oh goody, what's an object? Any object? Any type? I don't know. It's, it asks for the object type, but wait a minute. PHP is, a t is typed objects, so it shouldn't it know that? Is it some other kind of object? And uh, options, okay, same problem we had before. Name, my name? I don't know. <laughs> and context, second most useless variable name in the universe, after data. <laughs> I mean, what? I have no clue what to do with this function. To this day, I, I've been giving this presentation for years, I still have no idea what this function does, or why I would use it. If you do not document your code, it could mean a number of things. It could mean you're lazy. And if you're lazy, I don't trust your code and I don't want to use it. It could mean you're indifferent. Meh, I don't care if people can understand what I'm doing. If that's the case, I don't trust your code and I'm not going to use it. It could mean you have no idea what you're doing, and so you're hoping that if you don't document it, people don't realize that you have no idea what's going on. If you don't understand what's going on, I don't want to use your code because I don't trust it. It could mean you're embarrassed about it. You know this code is terrible, and you hope that if you don't document it, people won't notice, people won't blame you. Guess what? If I see terrible code that I know you wrote and you didn't document, I'm going to assume you're a terrible developer. There's code in the Linux kernel, in, deep in some driver somewhere, that says, you know, that has a comment on it. I don't know why that, this works, but it does. That is an incredibly useful comment, because it says, here be dragons. This is weird. This is complicated. Don't touch it if you don't know what you're doing. I don't. What should you document? Every single function in your entire code base. Every single method of every single class, every object property, including its data type, every constant, whether it's a class constant or a global, every parameter to every method or every function, every return value of every function or every method, no exceptions. We'll document those two. Why? So that I have some clue what to do with your code. So that you have some clue what to do with your code next week. Because you probably won't remember. I don't remember a week later. <clears throat> Usage docs. And we're not just talking about code documentation here. If, you're, you know, if you've heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, guess what? A code sample is worth a thousand comments. This is uh, a screenshot from the front page of Gearman. Gearman is a queuing server written for PHP, or it works well with PHP. On the home page, they've got a code sample, they've got a graphic describing how the system works, they've got a prose description. Oh my god, I, I've never used Gearman. I want to use Gearman on a project just because their documentation is that good. Has anyone ever said that about your code? If not, you've got work to do. So you'll forgive me a minor aside here. Uh, whoops. You may have heard this line before. <coughs> Clearly written code with well-named methods is self-documenting. So you don't need to comment it. Uh-uh. 
Just because something is well written doesn't mean it's obvious. If it's be a nice theory, it's a nice thing to shoot for, it's not actually true in practice. Here's an example. This is an actual code of a project I did a couple years ago. Normalized character set. Okay, we know what we're doing. We're passing the value. Okay, I'm assuming that's the string we're going to mess around with character set on. And we do nothing on ASCII. And then UTF-8, what are we doing? And false, we're going to play with Windows 1252. What? What? <coughs> Who can understand why we're doing this just from reading this code? That's what I thought. This is the actual code with the, the uh, comments in it. NB detect encoding only supports two character sets, but we very often get Windows 1252 character sets. Why? Because that's what Microsoft Word uses, despite the fact that the entire rest of the universe has switched over to UTF-8. But Word still puts out this crappy character set that nothing else in the universe can understand and breaks every system I ever touch. Not that this is, that this is a long-standing problem of mine. So we're going to guess that if we can't identify the character set, it's Windows 1252. And by the way, if it's some er other character set besides UTF-8 or 1252, it's going to break. We know this now. All right, and what are we doing in UTF-8? I have absolutely no idea why UTF-8 strings need to be converted from UTF-8 to UTF-8. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea why I have to do this. But if I don't convert the code, or convert the string to HTML entities, and then back to a string and tell it to force it to UTF-8, my code broke. I do not know why, but this worked, and I have documents of this fact, so whoever comes after me doesn't waste an entire day trying to figure out why removing those two lines broke the program. This is why documentation is important. This is why code comments are important. And as for Windows, yeah, same thing over again. We are going to guess that uh, if we can't identify the character set, it's coming from Word, because that's probably a safe bet given our user base. But other things may break. And rant. Docs are didn't happen. Okay, Number four, a UI is not an API. Because a user, a user interface is not an application programming interface. For the simple reason that a user is not a program. Most of the time. <laughs> a UI is a client of your API. But okay. Why are we building websites without a UI? Isn't a, U a website a UI? Well, no, because I said nothing about a website. We're talking about APIs here. We're talking about your business logic, the actual code, not this string of HTML we print out to these dumb things called browsers. Your code should be perfectly usable in a command line application, like uh, you're building something with CLEX maybe, or just your own custom setup. It should work in PHP unit, because PHP unit is testing your code, not your interface. You are writing tests, right? I hope so. Or maybe you're, you're writing a, a Rust service of some kind using you know, Zen Agility or Straight Up Symphony or your own thing or whatever. You know, this is a, the HAL browser. It's a standard, um, basically, client application for HAL output. That's what the Agility was using by default. And there's no UI here. There's just JSON strings you're outputting. Your code still needs to work. You still need to be able to verify your code works. And maybe as an edge case, you're building a form. Forms on a web page are an edge case for your API. For your business logic, this is an afterthought. A website is not an API. A website <coughs> uses an API. There's a difference. The API exists independently of the website. There's a common guideline. You're not done until you have three implementations. Three implementations, huh? Well. Unit tests, a web service call, command line application, and website. There's four. You actually don't know your code is going to work until you've done at least three of those. You don't know your code is done until you've actually tested it in three different use cases. A UI is not an API. Don't confuse the two. Number five. This is one of my favorite uh, sayings out of Drupal. You know that saying about standing on the shoulders of giants? Drupal is standing on a huge pile of midgets. This is true of all of open source. You are standing on the work of thousands and thousands of other people who have done good work before you. Really, don't reinvent the wheel. We've got enough as is, and half of them are broken. Don't make another broken wheel. Don't add to API bloat. If you don't need to write a new system, don't. If you don't need to design a new system from scratch, don't. 
please do not be the subject of an XKCD cartoon. Oh my god, there's 14 different standards for this thing. Nonsense. Let's come up with one that does everything. Okay. That failed. Don't let this be you. <clears throat> Whenever possible, leverage existing patterns for things. Mimic some other system. Don't design your API from scratch. <clears throat> Makes it easier to remember. It's a compliment to the other developer. They won't take it as an insult. It takes less work on your part. <clears throat> There's plenty of advantages here. Look at design patterns. Look at object-oriented design patterns. Look at uh, what's in Java. A lot of the documentation there is applicable to PHP. Whatever platform you're using, if you are, follow that pattern. If you're in Drupal, you're going to be using entities and hooks and so forth. If you're in Symfony, you know, you're going to use Symfony events. Don't come up with your own observer pattern. Just use events. Use Symfony bundles. Use YAML for your configuration. If you're in some other uh, system, follow whatever its patterns are. These are just the ones I'm familiar with personally. Go with the flow of your system. Go with the flow of your framework. That also makes it easier to document. If you can say, this is a listener, it works the same as every other listener, Use your users, other people using your API, don't need to think about it. They already know how it works. It saves you time, saves them time. The best API is the one you didn't have to write. Number six. In uh, the book, 97 Things Every Software Architecture Know, Kevin Henney made the comments, use uncertainty as a driver. What does that mean? It means, quite simply, don't make decisions if you don't have to. <coughs> Why not? You want to make changing your mind cheap. Good software makes changing your mind cheap. Because guaranteed, your client is going to change his mind. Multiple times. The day before launch. You're all, too, all quiet because you know what's happened to you. Is that it? I'm seeing people nod. Okay. But you can only change things if they're well encapsulated. So let's think about blogging. Let's, you know, we'll just log to the database by default because it's easy, it's there, we, we know we can do it. <clears throat> Great. And then your sysadmin comes along and says, no, 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 we need everything logged to syslog because, oh, we're running on Google App Engine, they insist on syslog. Or, oh, um, you know, we want it to tie into our existing logging framework. We want to be able to pull it up with the rest of our log analysis tools. Great. Fine, rewrite the whole thing in syslog. But, oh, wait, now we want to display these errors on screen, too, when we're in development mode so the developer doesn't have to go over here and you know, they do the logs, they can just see the error when it happens. Great, now I've got more code to write. But, okay, some errors in production, oh, production only, we need to send out SMS because we're an important site, and important sites pay, send people a pager message at two o'clock in the morning because that's how we know we're important. Thanks. <clears throat> or maybe you want to send it out on Twitter. I don't know why you would, but there is in fact a Drupal module that lets you put log messages out on Twitter. Please do not run it in production. Do not decide in advance which of these you're going to use. Just decide you're going to log stuff. Interfaces are your friend. Who here is developing around interfaces all the time? Everyone who doesn't have your hand up, please have your hand up within a week. Nice, simple way to do it. You have a log interface. You throw your log message at that interface. What sits behind that interface? Not your problem. That's just an object. On the other side of it could be a database logger, could be a syslog, it could be something that logs for the database and syslog, it could some, be something that sends only certain types of messages out to Twitter. Not your problem. Which means you can now change your mind at any time and the rest of your code doesn't break. <coughs> or even better, don't define your own interface, use PSR3. Defined by the Framework Interoperability Group. This is really all it is. It's a standard interface with one method for the uh, level of the error, a message, and some additional information. Yes, I know it's called context, I apologize. And then some utility methods. That's all it is. It's very simple. By using a common interface for it, it means I can now throw monolog at my system and not have to write my own logger. And I can then change my mind and throw the Zen logger at it instead and not have to change a single line of code outside of my dependency injection container. But the rest of my code can't tell the difference. It's just writing to this common interface. Maybe I want to use both. Okay, that's fine. This kind of separation, loose coupling, lets you change your mind when your clients change their mind the day before a launch, which they will always do. Another example, caching. Same thing, cache in the database. Oh no, you know, we need to cache the APC because it's faster. Crap. Uh, and then we use that. But wait, now we're scaling to multiple servers, so we can't use APC anymore. So let's cache the memcache. Crap, rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. But wait, no, memcache isn't cool enough anymore. The, this, the cool kids use Redis these days. 
Really? Fine. Rewrite, rewrite. No, now we have to use React. I don't even know what this is, but I've heard it used in the context of caching. I shouldn't have to think about this. I should just care about a cache interface. I should not have to decide up front what my caching system is going to be. So in Drupal 7, we've got a standard interface for it, nice and simple. Uh, and we also are working on a cache interface in the framework and probability group, PSR6. I am the editor for that. I apologize for the fact that we're still working on it, but coming soon. <clears throat> Encapsulation avoids decision making. You want to avoid decisions, which means you have to encapsulate things. You have to have loosely coupled components. How do you have loosely coupled components? The easiest way, explicit interfaces. Interfaces for everything. That lets you change your mind easily. That is the whole point of using interfaces. Use dependency injection. It's not just that it makes testing easier, although that's a certain, certainly a large part of it. It's also really helpful for changes that happen the day before launch. Because then I can just rip out one service, put in a new service in its place, and everything else is fine. Because I just was injecting that service everywhere else. I don't have to read unhard code things in different places. In order for this to work well, you need to separate your business logic from your data logic. No one, you're laughing at Tron, but not this. <sighs> Tough crowd. You want to maintain a separation of concerns between different parts of your system. It means interface-driven development. I will reiterate this many times. Interfaces, interfaces, interfaces. You want stateless services. Maintaining state makes it really hard to track elsewhere because your other systems depend on a given state in that, that service. Don't do that. Follow the single responsibility principle. One object does one job, which means if you want to change just that one job, you change just that one object. That's much easier than an object that does 12 things and you want to swap it out, you have to swap out all 12 things. And find dependency injection. Dependency injection gives you loose coupling, gives you the ability to change your mind. You want that. Avoid making decisions. Number seven, all this delegation is great. The delegation adds indirection. And indirection requires abstraction. That, great, we're talking about this, we're all, we're all good here. And abstraction solves, no, abstraction hides complexity. It just moves it around and makes it so you don't have to deal with it when you don't want to. But the complexity is still there. And in fact, adding that abstraction adds complexity. <coughs> that abstraction is not free. All of this loose coupling is not free. It has a performance impact. Uh, it could be at the language level. If you're using call user funk array for something, that's great, that's wonderful, it gives you, you know, the ability to do uh, dynamic dispatch within your program, and calling that takes three times as long as calling a function by name. If you're doing it in a, an object, underscore underscore call, costs as much as three method calls. There is a performance cost to this abstraction. Uh, if you have, you know, more, uh, something like a query builder in Drupal, uh, if you're building up SQL queries, the query builder, the dynamic builder for select queries in Drupal is 30% slower than raw queries, than just writing the SQL string. 30% slower. And really, Drupal's query builders are very basic. They're not that complicated. Doctrine is a much more complicated query builder, and it has to cache the output because it's too slow otherwise. All this ab abstraction adds weight. It also means it can be harder to understand. If you don't have the, your system separate out in the right way, then you could be digging through the code and trying to figure out, what's this doing? I, I've gone through 14 levels of you know, backtrace and I still have no idea what's going on. You can over abstract and it becomes worse than not having the abstraction. You have to balance it. There are two ways of constructing software. One is to make it so simple, there are no obvious deficiencies. The other is to make it so complicated, there are no obvious deficiencies. Guess which one is harder? The unavoidable price of reliability is simplicity. There is in the world no problem that cannot be solved by adding another layer of abstraction, except abstraction. And finally, your software has idiosyncrasies, but really, it's not special. If you're a Drupal developer, nobody understands Drupal's quirks except Drupal developers. And in my experience, frankly, most of them don't either. If you're a Symfony developer, Symfony's got plenty of quirks. Nobody understands those quirks except Symfony developers. 
and most of them don't either. PHP has got a lot of quirks. Nobody understands them except for PHP developers. And most of them don't have a clue either. PHP is weird, people. <laughs> Whatever your system is, nobody understands what you're doing except you. And usually you don't understand it either. It's too complicated to fit in your head at once. <clears throat> On the left here, this is uh, Caroline Nagishi. He's one of Drupal's uh, top developers. Really smart guy. Uh, he's written some amazing code for Drupal. Anyone can, can tell me who the guy next to him is? That's John Resig. I don't know, don't care how cool you are, John Resig, John Resig knows more JavaScript than you do. There's always someone who has done what you're doing before you better because that is their specialty. It is not your specialty to rely on someone else's expertise where possible. Believe me, I don't trust him to write jQuery. I trust him to write jQuery. Some numbers here. Third generation languages, that is, you know, languages like we're used to that are not, you know, they're steps above assembler, are 56 years old. PHP is 18 years old. It's old enough to drink. <laughs> that is the age in France, isn't it, 18? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Drupal, 12 years. Drupal's one of the older projects around that's still around. It's 12 years old. Your website, your project, maybe six months. What are the odds that you are doing something that has never been done before in all of this time? Pretty damn small. Are you doing something truly novel? I don't think so. Find existing wheels to reuse. Don't make new ones. Look on, on packages. Look through Composer. Find packages where you, that you can reuse. Look at Symphony 2. Those, the components in Symphony 2 are really powerful. They're really strong. They, you can do some amazing things with them. Look at Zen. Same thing. Uh, if you need an RSS parser or an Atom parser, for God's sake, don't write one. It's hard. They've already done it. Just use that. Use existing systems. Don't build your own framework when there's so many good ones out there. If you want a full stack framework, look at Symphony 2. Look at Zen. Look at Cake. If you want a CMS type system, look at Drupal. Drupal 8 is going to be awesome. <clears throat> do not write your own framework from scratch. Maybe for educational value, but for production, do not do this. You'll be rewriting things people have written 27 times before just this week. You don't want to waste your time like that. Use existing standards where possible. Look at the specif specifications coming out of the framework and probability group. For God's sake, do not design your own logger. Please. Once you have a cache interface out, for God's sake, do not design your own cache system. Learn how to use HTTP. HTTP is a very powerful spec. You want to leverage it. You know, who knows what REST stands for in REST API? It means I can go home and rest because I don't have to waste my time reinventing the wheel. That's what REST stands for. If you want caching in your application, HTTP has a caching system. It's very powerful. Use it. Don't invent your own. If you want to do validation, it's there. If you want to do authentication, it's there. Use the tools that are already available to you on the web. There's a ton of them. Please, use them to your advantage. If you have to write something new, learn from what's out there. Look at what's in Pickle. These are C extensions for P, uh, PHP. See what they're doing. Can you port one of those to the PHP user space? Look at jQuery. There's some interesting things happening in jQuery and in other JavaScript libraries around closures and anonymous functions that are really useful when you're dealing with modern PHP. Look at WordPress. It's fun to make fun of WordPress, but they've got a way bigger market share than everyone else in this room combined. They're doing something right. Look at what Symfony's doing. Look at what Zend is doing. Look at what Cake's doing. Look at all of these other systems. Look at Java. PHP's object model is inspired by Java. Most of the documentation you find, most of the articles you find online about good practices in Java apply to PHP, too. Learn from them. Look at you. Know, learn your design patterns. Again, many of them are written on the assumption of Java, but they still apply just as well in PHP. A good example of this uh, at work, Drupal 7 was the last great big monolithic system that didn't talk to anybody else. In Drupal 8, we pulled in nine different components from Symfony 2. We pulled in the routing system that we co-authored with Symfony CMF, uh, the Zen feed library we're using for RSS parsing. We're using Doctrine's annotations library. We're using Guzzle to replace our old crappy HTTP client that we had built in. Uh, RDF parsing, we outsourced the EasyRDF library. We're using Aesthetic now, we're using Twig. Uh, 
Oops, we've got PHP unit in there now too. This is all code that we got rid of our homegrown crappy versions of and replaced with standard components we don't have to maintain that people already know because lots of people are using Fig, lots of people are using Guzzle, lots of people are using Zen, and we don't have to reinvent those wheels anymore. You should be doing the same in your projects. Because really, there's a feature that you do not want in your project. No software platform needs this feature. That's ego. Which leads us to Durden's Law. You are not a special and unique snowflake. <coughs> All this adds up to kind of a grand unified theory of API design. And this is uh, my favorite quote in this talk. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. <laughs> but there's a corollary to that. You always know where you live, don't you? Six months from now, someone is going to have to do something with your code that you never thought of, that you never anticipated, and they will not be able to modify your code to get it done, but they've got only an hour to do it. That's going to be you in six months. Plan accordingly. Thank you. Follow me more. Uh, it's my company, Palantir.net. So I blog there occasionally. Garfieldtech.com is my site. Krell on Twitter. Give me feedback. Tell me how terribly I did. And I think we've got time for like two or three questions, I hope. So, questions? Anybody? Wow, I just wowed you all. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Um, regarding the um, UTF-8 example you gave with like uh, 50 or more lines of comments, <laughs> just after, I was wondering, but just afterwards you said uh, we are all testing as well. So do you really need both? Because if you already test for edge cases, no one is going to remove your code, so you don't have to comment everything in right like uh, an anti here. That assumes that the test is self-descriptive of why. Good comments indicate why. Why am I bothering to do this weird thing to handle character encoding? I could have a unit test that passes in a string that has some funky coding, encoding, but just looking at it, I don't know if the E with an accent on it is in UTF-8 or in Windows 12 52 necessarily. If not, I have to have a comment in the um, in the unit test saying, by the way, this string is a, a Windows 1252 string, and that's what we're testing. The comment is there either way. I'd rather keep the comments close to the code that they're describing to say, okay, just looking at this code, why am I doing this completely silly thing? Here's why. Okay. Oh, and that's it.